Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. And would you turn to your Bibles in, in Luke chapter 5? Luke chapter 5, you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So we're looking in the New Testament. And we will go to Matthew 9 as well. But I'm going to start in Luke chapter 5. How do we build bridges? How do we build relationships with someone so that we can get to the point where we share our faith about Jesus Christ? How do we do that? Last week was really a, just a phenomenal scripture to look through. John chapter 4, we learned that Jesus was thirsty, and that thirst led to a conversation, but we found out he was meant to go to Samaria, and when he was in Samaria, he was on a mission to bridge a divide between the Jews and the Samaritans, and he used water and a well and a woman who was a notorious sinner in that town. Her reputation was not good, and Jesus used her to start a revival in Samaria. But at the same time, Jesus was teaching his disciples that that conflict you had with that other nation or people group, it's time to put it to rest. It's time to bury it and to be in unity and love one another because they too belong in the kingdom of God. Jesus is very clear today in our scripture as well of how we can do this and we can miss it because it's so simple. And you, you might even be mad at me today because you're like, Ryan, that's too simple. What in the world? So let's, let's read it. And, I, and it's, it, it's, it's more than just simple. It, there's strategy in what Jesus does. But look at uh, Luke 5, and we're going to read. Um, oh, I'm in the wrong one. Where am I at? There we go. Luke, 20, Luke 5, verse 27. This is when Jesus calls Levi or Matthew. Luke 5, verse 27. Later, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple. Jesus said to him. So Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Later, Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. Many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. But the Pharisees and their teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. So they're going to his disciples and they say, say to his disciples, and they say, Why do you eat and drink with such scum? That's a powerful, hurtful word. So these Pharisees who are very religious, they're known for not even wanting to be seen with anyone who's considered a sinner in their eyes. Okay, anyone who does not do what they do, they consider pretty much sinners. If you weren't like them, you were a sinner. You were off. You weren't right. And so they're like disgusted at the fact that Jesus would actually go and, and, and go to this invitation, go to this banquet and receive it and actually be there among these tax collectors, and other guests. Jesus answered them. So Jesus must have got the word from his disciples what they said because the disciples tra uh, transferred the message and relayed it. And Jesus answered them, uh, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous or perfect or have everything together is what he's trying to say there, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. Those who are humble enough to realize that they need Jesus. Now, I want to go to Matthew 9. I want to read that version. Matthew chapter 9. I'm going to turn to there. Because Jesus adds something. There's something to add on the end here. Matthew 9 verse 9. You have different authors here, different perspectives on the scripture, and there's a piece that's left out in that one that's not left out in this one near the end. And it says 
I'm going, to read, I'm going to read the whole thing. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, they asked Jesus' disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of the scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. He says this, I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. Now this is what was called a Jewish idiom. Okay, It's not that he's saying don't practice your sacrifices. What he's saying is I want you to show mercy more than your sacrifices. What he was calling them out on was this. They were really dedicated to their temple worship and sacrifices, but they were really bad at loving everyone around them. They were super faithful of attending their church and doing their things, but when it came time to showing mercy to the worst people in society, according to them, they weren't very good at it. They weren't very good at it. And he says, I desire mercy more than sacrifice. Who called who sinners in this scripture? Did you see it? Who, who was the one that called them sinners. Was it Jesus? No. Now we see in scripture that they use this, this interaction to label this, that Jesus eats with sinners, as we can see the title of this. And Jesus is known for eating with sinners and, and being with them. But Jesus, Jesus did not label them sinners. He's well aware of their sin, but he didn't call them Sinners. We don't go around saying, hey, I'm going to go eat with a sinner neighbor today. Do we? Because that would be a little weird. That would probably turn some people off. Uh, I don't say, hey, I'm going to go eat with my sinner boss. We're going to have dinner together. I'm having my sinner boss over for dinner. We don't do that either. You know why? Because Jesus called his disciples by name, not by their lifestyles. Notice the Pharisees are the ones who called Matthew scum and sinner. And anything that was offensive to them, they would call them out by that. They labeled them. But here's the thing about Jesus. Jesus knows our sin but calls us by our name. Hmm. He knows our sin but calls us by our names. Praise God that, that Jesus sees more than just our sin. Does he see our sin? Yes. He does not ignore it at all. And can I, can I tell you, church, something that's really important? Having dinner with an unbeliever doesn't make you a hypocrite. It makes you a follower of Jesus. Having dinner with an unbeliever doesn't make you a hypocrite. It makes you a follower of Jesus. See, to them, they were trying to call out Jesus for being hypocritical here. What are you doing with them? That's not right. And Jesus is trying to show his disciples and everyone else that I have come for those who know they need a Savior. And what's interesting is, do you know what Jesus does later on in Scripture and actually in Luke? He's invited to the Pharisee's house, and guess where he goes? He goes to the Pharisee's house too. You know why? Because they're sinners too. Mm. He goes to that invitation as well. Because they're just as off as everyone else in this book. He's saying, show mercy. They were so good at making sure they gave and did everything the temple practices were, but they were actually really bad at even loving their own family members. You can read about that in Matthew 23. Jesus called them out. Now, when we look at this, we can go, well, I can go do whatever sinners are doing. I can go do whatever my neighbors or my boss are doing. Well, not exactly. We got to be careful we don't take the scripture and go where we shouldn't go with it. Jesus was on mission when he was with 
Matthew and the tax collectors. Jesus wasn't there to join the tax collectors in their money heist schemes to rob people. Jesus was there to change their life. Pastor and author uh, Kevin DeYoung, he comments on this scripture. This is what he says. Jesus was a friend of sinners not because he winked at sin, ignored sin, or enjoyed lighthearted revelry with those engaged in immorality. Jesus was a friend of sinners in that he came to save sinners. He was very pleased to welcome sinners who were open to the gospel, sorry for their sins, and on their way to putting their faith in him. And Jesus gave away in the scripture why he was there in the first place. Because he came for the sick. He came for those who were lost. He came for those who are living in sin, who need his help. So Jesus was clear right there. Everyone heard him say that he was there because they needed him. So where's the bridge that Jesus used here? How did he build it? Well, in order to have this opportunity, Jesus showed us a few practical ways in order for him to have this opportunity to share the truth, to share about their need. He did a few things. And the first thing is, and we learn here as well, the number one thing is be present in the lives of those who need Jesus. You know why? Because Jesus didn't come from eternity to be distant. He came to be close. He came to be close. Jesus chose to be with those who need him most, to be present where they are so he could share about his father's kingdom and the purpose of his presence. We do not see Jesus using letters, nor would Paul use letters as his primary method either. either. Uh, Paul, the only reason why Paul wrote letters was to write to the church, and he was in prison. He couldn't go to them. Did you know that the primary way that Paul preached the gospel was to be face-to-face with people? To be in their presence so that they could see it. Because the good news of Jesus is best communicated through personal encounters. Why is that? Because the gospel wasn't only meant to be preached or posted on social media. The gospel was meant to be demonstrated and felt by the way you treat others. The gospel was meant to be experienced, in other words. And so Jesus made sure that he was in people's lives. And that brings me to the next point. Jesus shows us, number two, Jesus shows us to do life together. To use hospitality. Jesus, when he got invited to a dinner, he said yes. Not because he was hungry, although he may have been hungry. But because he knew that this was an opportunity. This is an opportunity to have a conversation, and that brings us to the third thing he does. Because, by the way, Jesus Jesus was a teacher and a preacher, but you know what? In Scripture, we see a lot of conversations. Jesus taught the kingdom of God, taught about himself through conversation. Isn't that awesome? Why is that awesome, Ryan? Maybe you're asking, why is that awesome? Because maybe you don't want to stand up here today preaching like I am right now. Because you're scared and you have stage fright and all that stuff. Anyone like that? It's okay if you are. I'm, I'm actually nervous every Sunday, just so you know. It doesn't look like it, but I pray, ask God to help me to take over, and I, and I come up here. But the reality is, I only preach once a week. I can have hundreds of conversations all week. And so can you. Jesus was present in people's lives Taking the opportunity to have dinner with them so he could do what? Have conversations. I told you it's really simple. It is, isn't it? How many conversations have you had this week? And even more importantly, how many conversations were helping build a bridge to Jesus this week? Because that's how Jesus did it. And what was his point of doing it? To share the reason and purpose for his presence. In other words, we... This is the fourth one, share the reason and purpose for Jesus. Dorothy asked me a really good question this past week. When do you connect the dot with a neighbor or someone that's at dinner with you? When do you cross that line and bring up Jesus? This is a really good question, isn't it? I was like, hmm. Because you can have dinner for like two years and never bring up Jesus. And we're about to watch a video that's powerful. And they, they didn't wait that long to bring up Jesus 
but I'll, I'll give you a couple things that I do. This is evangelism 101, all right? You ready? When I've hung out with people and I've been having conversations with them, maybe having dinners, whenever I hear of an opportunity to pray for them, I ask, can I pray for that situation? Can I ask Jesus to help your situation? That's my first door in. That's my first door in. Let me pray for that. Can I pray for that? And then you're just praying God do a miracle, you know, like in your heart all week, right? And you're praying to yourself. But right there, you take a, you take a moment to pray for them right there. Now, if they're in a hurry, you say, I'm going to pray for you tonight. And by golly, you better not forget, right? The second thing I do, when I sense that they are receiving my fellowship and they know about my faith, they know that who I am. Um, by the way, I don't lead a lot of times as I'm a pastor. Because I don't really want people to think like, oh, he's a pastor. Oh, man, I got uh, I to gotta, I gotta clean this stuff. I got I to gotta be, be different. I want people to be real around me. So I'll tell them, you know, I'm a believer of Jesus Christ. Okay? Which is, they also might do that too. But. I start asking, and I'm going to read this because I specifically have asked this question, okay? When it gets to the point where we're having real talk about faith and real talk about life and upbringing or something like that, I'll go, what's your view of Jesus? That's it. What's your view of Jesus? Here's a follow-up question. Are you aware of what he did for you and I? I include myself in that. Are you aware of what he did for us? And another question I'll ask is, do you believe Jesus came to earth to save us from our sin and give us eternal life? I mean, who doesn't want eternal life? Anyone? No, don't raise your hand. You're not supposed to raise your hand on that. <laughs> who doesn't want eternal life? We all want eternal life, right? Who wants eternal life? There we go. Now we raise our hand. <laughs> I'll bring that up. I'll say... Are you aware that Jesus came to this world to offer us eternal life? Have you heard about that? You know, maybe your grandma, grandpa, parents, Sunday school, church. And it turns into this beautiful conversation. Conversation. Around a dinner. Being present. And guess what? You know what really helps that entire conversation? Is I wasn't a jerk. I was loving. I was caring. I acted like Jesus. I didn't call them sinners. I didn't say, hey, sinner boss, how you doing? Hey, what do you want to eat? I got the bill, by the way. Sinner. Like, that's, <laughs> I, don't do, I don't use labels. That's just so weird. But apparently, the Pharisees, they like doing that. So let me show you what I mean. I think one of the best ways for us to learn this today is to watch this testimony of a woman named Rosario Butterfield, and I pray it works online. We got permission, we got the copyrights, we got everything submitted. But YouTube and Facebook, they have been really strict on that, and they might cut off the connection, so I apologize, but we'll have the recording up later on YouTube if it happens. But this is a story of a woman who was very devout in lesbianism and was a doctor, and her thesis and everything was on gay theory. And yet she came to know Christ. So check, and by the way, you're going to hear some offensive things at first because she's being real about what she thought of us as Christians first. And then God did a work over dinners. All right, check this out. We live at this time where so many Christian ideas are understood as hate speech. After the Obergefell decision legalized gay marriage, that put the gospel on a collision course with the new law of the land. And I think many Christians have been struggling with, well, how do I speak? What do I do? How do I move forward? Home is a vital place to invite your neighbors in to have some heartfelt conversations. We can love our children together. We can let some things slide, even though the world we live in would say that we're supposed to be enemies. To me, hospitality is the ground zero 
of the Christian faith. I was raised in an Italian family. There were some issues in my house that made it almost impossible to have people in. So hospitality didn't really become endemic to my life until I had set up a home of my own. I was a professor at Syracuse. I lived as an out lesbian feminist in New York. In our LGBTQ community, somebody's home was open every night of the week. And there was never a question, where will I go if I need help? Because the community itself is organic and fluid, and that was how we dealt with crises. After I wrote my tenure book, I really wanted to write a book that was on my heart. Why is the religious right such a hateful community? And why do they hate people like me? I was on a war against two things, patriarchy and stupid. So I was really curious to know why relatively decent people would use the Bible in such a hateful way. So I wrote an editorial and it brought all kinds of attention my way, which I didn't really expect. But one of the things it brought my way was a letter from Ken Smith, the pastor of the Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church. When Ken and his wife Floyd invited me to dinner, I was happy. I, th I thought of Ken as my unpaid research assistant. And they were fine with the fact that I, I wanted to read the Bible to critique it. That began a research journey that changed my life. But it wasn't research that changed my life. In Ken and Floyd's home, the way that they practiced hospitality became a living, breathing example of the theology that they were teaching. After my first dinner at Ken and Floyd's house, Ken gave me a big hug, Floyd gave me a big hug and a kiss on the cheek. We said, we'll catch up next week. This was fun, can't wait to do it again. They did not share the gospel with me and they did not invite me to church. And that was so wonderful because what it showed to me was that they didn't see me as a project. They actually saw me as a neighbor. Now, I didn't step foot in the church for two years, but every week I was in their home. And every week, it was clear that pretty much anything could go. We could ask anything, Ken and Floyd were fine. And that process of dialogue and table fellowship was compelling. It was deeply compelling. I did not come to faith because I stopped feeling like a lesbian. It's not that I got all of my worldview issues just completely cemented with a happy Christian evangelism, not at all. I came to faith because I became convicted that Jesus is who he says he is. Ephesians 4.29 is our watchword, that we are to impart grace to the hearer. I might not agree with everything that you hold to be near and dear, but because we are neighbors, I don't have to say everything that's on my heart. And you don't have to say everything that's on your heart right now. We can put some of our worldview issues aside. And over years of this, the gospel takes on a momentum that is compelling to people. I think we need to give each other the reminder that it's God who saves. It's not about certainly us being perfect, or our words being perfect. But show up, we must, in the lives of unbelievers. What comes naturally to me and what comes naturally to you is to hang out with people who are like us. <laughs> people who can maybe finish our sentences, people who don't scare us. But hospitality, biblically speaking, takes strangers and makes them neighbors, and takes neighbors makes them family of God. It's a great joy to see the gospel bring people together who are supposed to be enemies. And it's a great joy to know that God never gets the address wrong. And if your neighbors aren't people you know yet, there's a blessing waiting for you.
Isn't that awesome? I have some things I would like to say. I have a lot of things i like to say about that video, but that's just an example, and I'll share a few things. Notice the amount of time it took. It took two years. Notice that their first night wasn't to share Jesus, and the first night, the first dinner, wasn't to invite them to church because the goal was to build a bridge, to build a relationship, and to have her return, Lord willing, and come back, and they processed. If you read her story, by the way, uh, right now she travels the nation to help churches and help people who, who are living in this lifestyle and to help churches reach them. It's amazing. And you ready for this? That would not have happened if two people didn't say, come over for dinner and we're going to love you as a person. We're going to love you as a neighbor. The word neighbor in the Bible, when it says love your neighbor, it doesn't necessarily mean your literal neighbor. It means anyone, everyone. And then you can also love your literal neighbors. That's what the word neighbor means, to love everyone. You see, this pastor and his wife, they didn't see her for her sin. They saw her as someone God loves. They saw someone God loves. And they wanted to spend time with her. And the thing is, is in her community, they were always together. In the community she surrounded herself with, there was always an open home. And so we as a church must be ready to be open as well, to open up our lives to welcome anyone who would like to eat with us or to have coffee with us or to play games or whatever it may be. Our community groups that we have right now are so important for this, is that we're, we have an open door for whoever wants to come. And the thing is, is they weren't offended by her views. They didn't get all up in arms and go, oh, yeah, well. No. There were times where they just held their tongue and they just listened and processed and asked questions. You can watch even more testimony and, and more stories of her life on YouTube. But here's what I, I, t I really take away from this. Jesus was experienced in their hosting and the conversations they had around the table. Jesus was experienced. Talking around the table was life-changing for her. And she wasn't a project. She was a person. And I love what she said. Our words don't have to be perfect. But show up, we must, in the lives of unbelievers. You don't have to have a perfect church. We can love imperfectly. Hospitality takes strangers and makes them neighbors and takes neighbors and makes them the family of God. That was beautiful. That's the goal. But here's the thing. Some of us are like, well, I'm not a very good host. Well, then let someone else cook. <laughs> Go to a restaurant, you know, go to get coffee somewhere, you know. You don't have to do it in your home. Maybe you don't have a place for that. Maybe you don't want to bring someone in your home. You don't feel comfortable. That's fine. But your workplace, too, can be a place as long as it's, you know, cool for you to do that during lunch breaks and things like that. God is, is asking us. Jesus showed us to be present in people's lives who need him. And God help us to, to learn how to do that. I want to close with this in a story. Uh, we build bridges to connect and love people so they can see God's love is real. Perhaps then, if they see that God's love is real, they'll believe all the other teachings of God too. They'll believe all the other things in the Bible too. If they will see that God's love for them is real, they'll begin to open up. That's what happened. She started to realize that God's love is real, it's true, because they demonstrated it in their home, in their life for years. It took two years. Can you imagine the endurance, the stamina that they had to have? And they did by the help of God. And uh, this is one thing I practice all the time, because when you have someone in your life that is a complete different opposite person than your lifestyle, if you're a Christian, right, and someone lives a whole other lifestyle, this is what I do. I don't look for places to correct. I look for places to connect. I look for places to connect. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. So when I'm hanging out with my literal neighbors, I love them because they're my neighbors. And I'm not looking for something to fix and correct because Jesus does that. I'm looking for a way to connect Jesus to their life, to connect the dots. The reason why the word for us today was so real and true is because 
God knew I was about to share this story of someone in our church. I'm going to have them nameless just in case you know where she lives because of her story. But I, I want to read this. This is someone that I would not expect to do this. And I pray this encourages you to go out this week and build a bridge for the opportunity to share love and hospitality and to connect Jesus with their life. Ready? This is what she wrote to me. Naturally, I am a shy person. So going up to someone and starting a conversation on my own can be a lot for me at times. And who this person is? Extremely shy. But I would always pray for our neighbors around us. And if there was something or anything I could do physically for them to show God's love and witness to them. Oh, and as if I'm not already nervous to go talk to them, my next door neighbors have been arrested twice in the past year. So you can imagine how I was feeling. But nonetheless, they still need the gospel just as much as I do. I love that. So as I prayed for anything to do, I felt led to leave a note simply saying, we are praying for you. Let us know if you need anything. It's that simple. And that's what I did the following day. The day after, I felt led to do the same thing for my mailman, saying, thank you for all that you do. We are praying for you. They're forgotten, aren't they? <laughs> a couple weeks ago, I felt led to take it further and try and witness to my neighbor across the street who has always been very friendly to us ever since we moved in. I baked some brownies to give as a thank you for her generosity to us in case we needed anything. She was very touched by it, and I also took the opportunity to invite her to church the next day, hoping and praying she would be receptive to coming, which was a good, she knows this situation. She knows if she could do that or not. She noticed something about her. She was thankful I invited her, but reassured she does indeed go to Southside Baptist and is a Christian. <laughs> Isn't that cool? And then we talked for well over an hour about God's goodness and what difference he has really made in our lives. I am thankful that not only, it, not only did it give me an opportunity to better get to know my neighbor, but that I had the courage to do it on my own and that God was there through it all. So she wasn't really alone, was she? I still continue to pray for the rest of my neighbors, and if there's anything else I can do to further build bridges and bloom where I am planted. Awesome. That was it. She started building the bridge through hospitality, kindness. And I told her, you know what? Now you, have a, now you have a teammate, a neighbor you know who's a believer too because of what you did. And together you can pray for your neighbor. It doesn't matter what church she goes to. You don't have to go to Calvary to do this. This is the gospel. This is the Bible. This is, this, every church should be finding this. So now they can team up together and love their neighbors. Church, I want to encourage you to take this message today to not label people for their sin, not to classify them, not to, to, to choose whether you're going to love your neighbor based off of what lifestyle they live. Love your neighbor because Jesus said to love them without questions. Amen. And may God give you the courage. Why don't we stand and we're going to pray that. May God give you the courage to start that bridge. I'm excited this Sunday if the Lord tarries. Time is short, isn't it? Time is short. If the Lord tarries, we're going to have a really interesting conversation for Sunday next week with, uh, with Dorothy and I on conversations that heal and rebuild bridges that have been a little shaky and broken down. It's going to be a really important conversation right here on this stage. Um, but right now, let's, just, let's go with courage and strength. God, we thank you so much for these examples. We thank you for your example of Jesus Christ. Help us to be present in people's lives this week. God, I pray that we would seize those moments to show hospitality and kindness and love. God, may you bless our conversations, Lord. God, time is short. We need to have conversations that love and listen. Lord, we thank you that the example in the video today, we were taught that to listen to someone, even if it takes years, to listen and love them. And Lord, I pray that we would be wise and, and know when to connect the dot, when to share Jesus, when to pray, when to bring Jesus up. And Lord, I know that you've shown me, you've taught many people that people are actually really looking for hope. They're looking for love. They're looking for Jesus, even when they don't realize it. So God, give us the courage this week to not overthink it either, but to be led by your spirit to love people as you loved us. We thank you for this message. We thank you for the life of Rosario Butterfield, who's been changed by your grace. And God, give us opportunities like that again. 
this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church. Have a great Sunday.